And so I don't know about y'all, but how do you normally greet somebody? Like, do you say hi? Do you shake a hand? Do you do something special in particular? Are there certain ways that you greet one person? Is it different with somebody else? In the Cambodian culture, the particular way that you greet people is you do something called timbripsu, which sounds more complicated than it is, but it's pretty simple. You basically just put your hands together and you greet them. Usually there's a little bit of a bow, and how much you bow kind of depends on how much older the person is above you. So again, like just people like our age and stuff like that, I would just like, hey, how are you, timbripsu? You know, hello. And it's really cute because like my nephew, he's the youngest one we have. Whenever he goes to the Cambodian donut store, he's trying to earn free donuts, and so he's just like, hello. Like he's just, just huge, deep bow and they're like oh it's so cute and they give them free donuts and stuff like that but it just kind of depends you know I know here like in in Vietnamese like you tend to jow other people if I've said that and thought that properly like we're trying to do that with uh, our, our daughter Olivia when uh, her grandma comes over her bawai she, when she takes care of her when she's leaving which I was like okay Olivia ah bawai you know just trying to teach her how to properly and I, I tend to bow her for her again she probably doesn't have any idea what's happening but again it's just getting the habits down getting the idea of what's supposed to be happening Again, here in America, we generally most often just handshake. Maybe if, again, you're guys, you may do the hand hug kind of a thing, whatever it may be. You kind of pick and choose what you want to do. I remember in high school, growing up in Ailey, I mean, there were some very complicated handshakes, and I, I don't even want to try to replicate all the stuff that they did. Again, if you, if you know about it, you know about it. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's not really <laughs> worth diving into here. But in looking up a bunch of the different greetings, one of my favorite ones was actually from Malaysia. What they would do is, it's very formal, very traditional, so they don't do it just like, hey, how are you, and they do this. It'd be, again, like formal events, if you're greeting like the president or prime minister, or whatever they have, they place their hand on their heart. And it's a representation of togetherness, it's unity, it's, it's again, with one heart that we want to do whatever we're doing here. So I thought it was just kind of a cool thing together. And I guess also like putting the hand over heart just kind of gets you close to Wakanda forever. So it kind of was just kind of cool to kind of see and think of and whatnot, but again, whichever way you choose to greet somebody in whatever complicated, simple fashion, whatever it may be, it, a greeting isn't just like a formality. It's not just something we do, but it's, it's acknowledging somebody, right? It's, it's saying, hello, it's, I see you. I appreciate that you're here. I'm glad you're here. It's a way to show somebody that you care about them. And here we are, we are in the last chapter of Romans. It has been just a crazy journey. We've been in this for a pretty close to over a year now. So again, we are in the last chapter of Romans, and Paul is going to show us why and how he greets people here. And so again, we've been in this series, we've been diving through the gospel shift and seeing, again, just how the gospel shifts everything in our lives. Right? Because of what Christ has done on the cross for our sins, everything in our lives is, is required to shift because that's who he is. That's who Christ is and what Christ does in us. It, it shifts our lives and it changes everything about us. That because of how Christ died and, and sacrificed his life for our sins, we now respond by being living sacrifices, as Paul has told us in chapter 12, to be living sacrifices for him now, for Christ now. That changes, again, it shifts how we act with one another, it shifts how we act in terms of like the government, it shifts how we think, how we pray, again, everything about us shifts because of what Christ has done. And so again, today we're going to see how does the gospel shift us when we greet other people, when we welcome people here into this church. I think that's a little bit of what Paul dives into here this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, again, we're going to be in Romans chapter 16. We're going to take it from the very top, Romans chapter 16, verse 1. And so again, in verse 1, Paul reads to us here, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Chenchery. That you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever way, in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many, and of myself as well. And so in these first two verses, real quickly, we see Paul greets Phoebe. Right? He, he introduces and he, he tells them, this is Phoebe. This is the person that I want you to, to show appreciation for. And specifically, he calls her in verse 1. He says, I commend to you our sister. Again, he isn't familial. It's not a family relationship that he's calling her sister. But he's saying spiritually that she has come to faith in Christ just as I have come to faith in Christ. So she is my sister in Christ. This is why you hear us sometimes when we address other people like, hey, how are you doing, brother? Because it's, again, it's not that I'm actually related to you. But it's as we are now part of God's family. We've been adopted into his family. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. But not only is Paul addressing her as sister, he takes it a step further and he calls her a servant of the church. 
Right, Paul has taken time to acknowledge that Phoebe is somebody who has given of her time to God. In fact, he even says in verse 2 that, again, she has been a patron of many people as well. That she has not only given her time, but she's given her money in order that the gospel can be spread. Phoebe is somebody who has helped finance Paul, and he's also set other people as well for one purpose. And again, that's to help spread the gospel to the land around them and to the people around them. It's because of all of this that Paul tells you at the beginning of 2 to welcome her. Right? He's telling the church in Rome, as she enters into the building, as she enters into your presence, as she enters into the congregation, welcome her worthy of somebody who has accepted Christ. Because that's who she is. She is worthy of the saints. She is worthy of being welcomed in a way of the saints. Again, in a sense, this is Paul kind of writing her uh, like a recommendation letter and then in this way you can think of. Because most likely, and again, this isn't explicitly said, but most scholars would agree that Phoebe is the one who took the letter and is bringing it to the church in Rome. So she's handing them this letter and they're reading through it. Again, they would have stood, they would have taken this letter and they would have read the whole thing aloud. And then he would have gotten to whoever was reading it, would have gotten to this point and said, like, here's Phoebe, the one who brought us this letter welcome her, thank her, appreciate her, and help her in whatever way we can, because she has done much for the gospel. And so I think in looking at these first two verses, it kind of begs the question for us today. How do we treat people who come into our church? How do we welcome people when they enter into our church? Like, do we treat them, do we welcome them as worthy of the saints, as Paul says here? If somebody comes in, do we roll out the red carpet to them? Literally, we actually have red carpets here. Do we roll out those red carpets to welcome them? Or do we shun away? Do we hide away? Do we try to get away and let somebody else take care of those things? Because I think those are the two main reasons that our general response, the natural way that we want to respond. When somebody comes in, you don't recognize them. You look at them and you think like, hey, let me catch up with you over here for a second. Somebody else can greet them. I'm going to talk over here. I'm talking to you, so I can't, I can't greet that person who's come in. So let me handle, let me handle this conversation here. All right, I think that's one way that we kind of naturally respond. The other way is we sit there and we think like, oh, somebody's here. Let me, uh, let me go and update my phone. All these little red dots, I need to make sure that they're all gone you know, for security reasons. You know, I haven't updated my phone in 10 years, but now seems like a good time that I need to do so. And I say these things because that's, that's my natural response too, right? When somebody comes in, I don't think like, oh, let me go out there. I want to put myself out there. I want to engage with them. No, my natural response is I'd rather talk with the people that I know. I'd rather be in my comfort zone of the people that I'm familiar with because y'all are the people that I know what jokes to make. I know how you guys are. I can, I can relate to y'all more specifically, but that's not what Paul is calling us to. That's not what, as people who have been shifted in the gospel, that's not what we're called to do. In fact, we should be taking the initiative because that's what Christ has done for us. Right? We look in 1 John, that uh, John in this case wrote, and he says, we love because he first loved us. Right? That as followers of Christ, that people who have been shifted in the gospel, we are called to love because Christ loved us first. That when somebody comes in, it should be our responsibility to, to rush, in a sense, to greet them because Christ didn't wait for us. Right? Christ wasn't waiting for us to be good enough, and that's why he came to the cross, because we met his standard. Right? Christ wasn't waiting for us to love him first so that he would then love us. No, Christ loved us in our sinful state. That's even what we've gone through here in Romans, that despite us as sinners, Christ died for us. And it's because of that love, it's because of that calling, that again, we are called to enter in and find people. When they are new to the church, we should be fighting each other, saying, like, it's my turn to greet the person. It's my turn to say hello. Instead of hiding away in our natural state, which again, even I kind of want to do, it should be our desire to shift ourselves, to greet people in a way that they've never been greeted before, to enter them, to welcome them in, to think of them as celebrities. Like, wow, I can't believe you're here. We're so grateful that you're here. And we're happy that you chose to celebrate and to worship God here with us here in this place. And so that's how we see Phoebe has shifted in the gospel, to serve in the way that she has. That's how Paul is calling the church in Rome to shift to welcome her in a way like none before. And that's how we are called to shift, is to shift how we welcome people as they enter into our church. So the next group that Paul welcomes is a couple, actually, uh, Prisca and Aquila. So let's continue in verse 3 here. Paul says to, again, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. So again, the next person that Paul greets here is Prisca and Aquila. 
We actually meet this couple beforehand. This is in Acts, uh, I think, 18, if I have the reference. I didn't actually write it down, but it's in Acts 18 to 20, somewhere around that area. Paul is in his second missionary journey. He's traveling through, and he stops in Corinth, and he meets with these people. And Prisca and Aquila are actually tent makers. And Paul says, hey, like, I like to make tents too. I think this is a profession I can do. Let's, let's see if we can partner up. How can we work together so that we can you know, pay for the things we need to do? How can we afford to take care of the ministries that we've been called to? And so Priscilla and Aquila are essentially like they're work friends, but he continues and he says, they're not just work friends, but again, they, they risked their lives for me. They put their neck on the line for him, for, for, for Paul is what he says. And we don't have the official details of like, what is it that they did? What is it that they, how is it that they saved Paul's life? But again, the phrase to, to risk your neck, to put your neck on the line, translate the same way today as it did back then. Somehow, some way, Prisca and Aquila, they put their life on the line in order to save Paul. They sacrificed everything they had. They were willing to give up their lives to save Paul for the gospel, to continue to help spread the word of who Christ was to the world around them. And Paul says that not only does he thank them for their work, but he also says all the churches of the Gentiles thank them as well. The Prisca and Aquila were leaders. They were leaders of their church when they were in Ephesus. And now that they've come now to Rome, they're leaders of the church in Rome that they've started here as well. Again, in Ephesus, you hear the story of Prisca and Aquila. They come and they teach somebody named Apollos, is who we hear of. And Apollos, he was a very gifted speaker, somebody who, who just naturally was, uh, again, just gifted with oratory skills. But he was half speaking the truth. He had known of John's gospel, the, the John the Baptist. He was teaching of his story, but he wasn't teaching of everything that Christ had come to do. And so as Apollos was teaching, Prisca and Aquila, they come forth and like, hey, like, you're, you're doing good work, but you're missing part of the story. All right, so if you have like a two-part movie, you've only seen the first part, and you start talking about how it ends, but you haven't seen the ending. You don't know how it actually ends. And so Prisca and Aquila, they come and they give him all the information so that he can now preach the full gospel, fully understood, fully comprehended. Because again, they have spent time with Paul, working with Paul, building tents with Paul, spreading the gospel with Paul. I so say they come together and they teach Apollos what it means to teach of what Christ has done. But if that wasn't enough, again, they started the church in Ephesus when they were there. And eventually, again, when they came back to Rome, they started another church here in Rome. And that's what Paul says in verse 5. That he says to greet them in the church, to greet the church in their house. Right? Wherever it was that Prisca and Aquila went, they made a point to bring people to God. And I think that's a lesson that we take too as well. As we look at them as they continue to greet the church in their house. That it's wherever we go, whether we've been called to Houston, whether we've been called to Dallas, whether we're here in Texas or California, wherever it is that we are at, we're called to, to make disciples of Christ. And then one last note, and looking specifically at what Paul writes here, because again, Paul chooses his words carefully. He says, greet also the church in their house. So again, the order matters here. Paul is saying, Greet the church in their house. He's not saying greet the people in the church. He's saying greet the church that meets in the house. Now, we've talked through this before, and I've, I've gone through this when we looked at Ephesians and things like that. But the church is where we gather. right? It's not about the building itself. That because we're here, we're here now, this is the church. But if this building burnt down... And we had to go somewhere else. So we went to Helen and Gerald's house, or we went to Michelle and David's house, or we went to our house, or, or any of our houses. If we gathered in that place, that would be the church. And so Paul acknowledges that, and he says, greet the people, greet the church that's meeting in the house. Don't think of the building and say, hey, go to West Houston. He's saying, greet the people, enjoy the people, say hello to the people, call out to the people who are here. And so we see, again, how Prisca and Aquila has just shifted everything in their lives. That they would sacrifice their lives for the gospel. That they've risked their necks, as Paul says, for himself. That they've continued to pour out everything that they have in order to make churches wherever that they go. And they continue to disciple and to make leaders of the people who are around them. Because all the churches that Paul is saying thank Prisca and Aquila, they're thanking for the work that Apollos has done. Because they taught Apollos, and Apollos teaches others. So they're saying thank Prisca and Aquila for the work, that everything that has been accomplished through them. And so this is what Paul is shifting us towards in these first three people, essentially. And very quickly now, in the next ten verses, Paul is going to thank about and greet 28-some people. Some of them specifically, some of them are large groups. 
And so to not make this a giant, exceedingly long message, I, I don't have enough information even in some of the letter that Paul has here. I'm not going to go through every single name that we have. I want to read through them, and I might butcher some of these names, so bear with me as my Greek and my Hebrew is not completely up to date. But I'll, I'll read through these next ten verses here, and then I'll see a couple groups that I think kind of form of how we can kind of see some patterns that Paul is, is just thanking and greeting these people for. So again, this is the rest of verse 5 all the way to verse 15. Greet my beloved Epinatus, who was the first convert into Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Julia and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatitis, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those of the family belongers to Arstes. Aristobulus. Sorry, I had that practicing this and I still messed it up. I tried a couple times. I was pretty good all the way here. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis who had worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen the Lord, also his mother who had been a mother to me as well. Greet Asirnictus, Philip. Uh, Flee, ah, man, I was doing so good. Fly, uh, Fleg, Fleagon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Fly, Philologus, Julia, Nurses, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Y'all have fun reading that later. Again, <laughs> we always joke around this passage, and nobody wants to read this section because there's just a whole bunch of names that we have no idea how to say. But again, I think in looking at all of these here, I think there are a couple different groups that we can kind of form and see. I think these are patterns that we see why Paul is greeting these people in particular. And I think the first group that we kind of see kind of form is Paul says he thanks and he greets people who he has deep affection and care for. Right? A lot of the people that calls, or a lot of the people that Paul is greeting, he calls them his beloved. Right? He calls them approved or chosen in Christ. And I think this tells us a lot about Paul. Because myself included, I don't know if this is the way that you thought of Paul. When I think of Paul, I think of somebody who's working on a table, writing letters, and, and continuously just thinking, like, how can I send my next letter to the next church to teach them of what God has taught me? But when we read through this list of 28-some names, and again, some of them are families and households that he's talking about. He's saying, I'm a people person, right? Not only have I worked through to write out what the gospel has taught me, but I love the people I've interacted with. They are my beloved, as he calls them. And again, Paul is, again, like I said, somebody who chooses his words carefully. So he could have easily said, those are my friends. But no, he chooses to say, greet my beloved friend here. Greet those who are beloved to me. And I think this fits into the lesson that Paul has been teaching us here. That, again, when visitors come in, when people who haven't been to our church before, when people enter into our place, how are we greeting them? When it's somebody that you've known for your entire life, how are you greeting them? Are you seeking them out in love? Are you seeking out friendship? Are you seeking out connection, community, engagement? Paul is saying that all of those can be found when you love one another, when you treat one another in a way, again, that's with deep affection and care. And so, again, while it's easy for us to stay in our comfort zone, Paul is telling us to go out, to greet one another. A way that you could also translate greet is also to reach out. Reach out to those who are here with you. Go to one another because, again, you are loved and loved by Christ. And we should love upon one another. I think the second group that we look upon here is those who worked alongside of Paul. Now, first off, this isn't saying that Paul didn't love them as well, but he's saying that there is a higher thing that I have respect for them in, and it's the work that they've done for the gospel. The Perry says that Paul, Paul says that Mary has done good work, that Urbanus has done good work, that Tryphena and Tryphosa have done good work. And the Greek word that's used here for work is actually, it's probably better translated um, like working to exhaustion. Right? It's not that they've just, oh, like, hey, I think I could help out this Saturday if you need me. Like, actually, you know, pencil me in. I think I can make it. No, it's not that. It's not like, oh, I'm pretty sure I can be there, but, you know, don't count on me. Like, count me as like an extra. No, these are people who are giving everything that they have. They're working to exhaustion for the glory of God. They're sparing no expense. They're burning the candle at both ends, as we would say. 
And again, just to brag on somebody here that I can think of, and again, I didn't ask him to, that I was going to do this, and he can't stop me because I have the microphone here. But again, Ani is somebody that comes to mind in our church here. That this guy, he gets together and he plays drums for us here in our service, and then he plays drums for the Vietnamese service, and then he helps out with worship at his own church that takes place at 3, 3.30. So this guy is here on and off, but I mean, he's here from like 9 a.m. to like 6 or 7 p.m. Like, I know some of us, we kind of complain, like, ooh, like, we got to be here till 3? Like, eesh, that's a long time. Like, I don't know if I can make it that long. Like, I sometimes am like, man, I got to stay here till this long or so forth. This guy on the regular, on the weekly, is here about 12 hours every single Sunday, not including times that he comes for practices, not including times when I've called him and be like, hey, can you help me move tables and chairs? And he says, yes. This is a man who labors on top of his schooling and everything that he's done. And again, I can't, again, this is, I think, what Paul is telling us when he's talking about these people. These are people who have labored to exhaustion for the glory of God. Because Ani doesn't do this because he wanted me to say this. I mean, he didn't know I was going to talk about him this morning. He does this because he loves God. He loves what Christ has shifted in him. And now his heart has been pulled to what God has called him to. I think these are the workers that Paul is talking about. So when he greets these people, he's saying, these are the people that I have loved, that I enjoy spending my time with, that I enjoy community with. And these are people who I've loved working alongside of, and I've seen them sacrifice day in and day out. And it's in this letter, he says, greet these people, reach out to these people, spend time with these people, because I am longing to spend time with them. Again, Paul is saying he is longing to come to Rome. So he's looking forward to seeing these people in person when he does. And so looking at these verses, at the end of the day, like, what are we supposed to do with them? Right? Because when we look at these verses, like, we understand, like, Paul is acknowledging all these wonderful people. And that's great, and that's awesome, but, like, but what do we do with that? How do we, how do we apply the greeting to a bunch of people? What's funny about this chapter, and this section in particular, is a lot of people tend to skip it. They'll go through Romans 1 through 15, and they'll just stop, because in here in 16, it's just a bunch of names. It's not that big of a deal. There's not as much theology to teach over. There's not as much stuff to teach over. But the fact of the matter is that the names are here, and the names are here for a reason. And if you don't really understand the power of a name, then I encourage you to go find a place where you see a lot of names. The one that came for Brittany and I when we were, we were traveling in uh, Hawaii a couple years back before the pandemic started. We went to the Pearl Harbor Memorial, and we had a chance to stand before this giant wall of names of people who had died, who had sacrificed their lives for, the, for again, I want to say the gospel. They sacrificed their lives, again, for this country. And again, while Brittany and I may have not had any direct connection there, we knew that there were people there who were seeing their uncle's name, their father's name, their great-grandfather's name, their brother's name on that wall. And so you tell those people that names don't matter. You tell Paul that these names don't matter. And he'll stand and correct you. That names matter. That people matter. That we don't understand the significance of a name until you stand in that moment and you see the great thanks, the great honor that people give to them. And so these people here in these 15 verses, again, they're being honored for the work that they've done, for the sacrifice that they've done, for the love that they've given and the love that they're receiving for being prisoners because of what they've said in the name of the gospel. They're being named here because of the gospel. And I think what ties us all at the very end here is what Paul tells us in verse 16. He tells us, not only do we greet others, but we greet one another with the holy kiss. That all the churches of Christ greet you. Paul is telling us that, again, we are to greet one another with the holy kiss. And so to make this significantly more applicable, what we're going to do is we're going to install mouthwash in the bathrooms to help us. No, I'm joking. I'm not actually, we're not actually going to encourage you to kiss one another. Although mouthwash in the bathrooms is not the worst idea, especially, again, if you've had a heavy deuce of nicknam or fish sauce. It might be more loving than you might think. So we'll see. That might be a back burner project we look at one day. But either way, again, in looking at this, joking aside, Paul is saying to greet one another with a kiss. Right, in, in the first century, it would have been common for people to kiss each other on the cheek or even from cheek to cheek. But more specifically, this wasn't like a male to female. It was very common for a man to greet another man this way and for a woman to greet another woman this way. It was actually fairly inappropriate for a man to greet another woman this way except for his wife. And so Paul is telling us to greet one another with a holy kiss. And for us today, that's maybe not a kiss. Maybe, again, like I was saying, it's a, it's a handshake or it's a hug. 
Even if it's your first time with us, I'd be happy to say hello to you. I stand at the back every single Sunday, and I just greet people. I, I say farewell to them. I say, looking forward to see you next week, or see you in Sunday school in a few minutes here. Like, it's an honor that I can do that. And Paul says that we are supposed to do that with one another. And again, remember who he's writing this to. That Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, who are mixes of Jews and Gentiles, who are men and women alike, who are slaves and some free. And it says to all these people who you have very little connections to, greet one another because it unifies us in the gospel. Greet one another as if you're family. Greet one another as if you're best friends. Because this is what Christ has done for us. That this gospel unifies us greater than any other division that you can think of, whether culturally, language, or socially. All of this is secondary compared to our unity in the gospel. And this is why in a couple weeks, on the fifth Sunday, every fifth Sunday, we generally we try to do a joint service where our English, our Vietnamese, and our French-speaking church, we all join together for one big service. And the reason we do that is because, again, despite whatever language you speak, whether it's English, Vietnamese, French, or a combination of all three, or whatever it may be, there's one thing that we unify in this place above all else, and that's the name of Jesus. So this morning, as we continue to seek unity, if you've been looking for that, if you've been looking for community, if you're looking for connection or relationships, then you find it here in Christ. And if you haven't committed your life to Christ, if you haven't started this relationship with him, then we'd love to help you in that process. We'd love to come down and tell you what it means to commit your life, to put your faith in the work of what Christ has done here on the cross. We'd love to tell you why all of these people have given their lives, have serviced everything they have, have sacrificed all they have, given of all their energy to one purpose. And again, that's Christ. And so let me leave you with this one last thought as we kind of conclude here. Again, I don't know how many of you are fans when it comes to your devices, whether your tablets, your phones, your computers. Uh, again, I'm a huge fan of using dark mode. Like, I think it just looks a little bit nicer. But in addition, it also takes up less battery, right? It's, on your phone, it takes more energy to shine light than it does to shine darkness. And I think for us, it, it forms this perfect illustration of who we are this morning. Because I didn't actually mean to, I didn't realize I was up again. But we're done with the slide, so that's fine. But again, when you think of dark mode, again, in our lives, it's easy for us to hide. Right? It's easy for us not to go out and take the initiative to welcome. It's easy for us not to push for community. It's easy for us just to go home and do nothing. It's easy for us just to charge on our own, to think of ourselves by ourselves. It takes more effort to be light. It takes more effort to shine brighter. It takes more effort to, to go beyond what is dark. And I think that's why God gave us the church. And I mean that again, as the people. That's why God gave us one another. It's because we recharge with one another. We recharge when we connect with Christ and we connect with Christ with one another. We build up a community. We build up, again, this body that together we serve with one another. We sacrifice with one another. We serve one another. We sacrifice for one another. And in this community that we've been given here, again, we see light shine. That together we can do more for the gospel than we can do individually. But ultimately, again, we've been called to serve. We've been called to sacrifice. We've been called to recharge, to connect with one another in Christ. And we're called to stay connected to the church so that we can encourage one another, to serve one another, to sacrifice for one another, to be together for the gospel with one another. Because ultimately, again, despite all the differences we may have, there's one thing that unifies us, and that always will be the gospel. That in every service project we do, it's because of the gospel. That every fellowship activity we do, it's because of the gospel. For every Sunday school, for every conversation, for every game that we play, it's for the gospel. And it's because of that reason and that reason alone that, again, we've gathered in this place and we continue to gather here on these Sundays to glorify God, to sing these songs, to hear of messages. It's because we are passionate about the gospel. And so, again, I encourage you, if you haven't formed community here, if you haven't joined into a group, then plug in. Again, our girls had a wonderful night out and just celebrating and fellowshipping together, and that's awesome. For us guys, maybe we'll go to like Denny's. That's probably the equivalent of what we may do. But again, we'll do something. And we want to do stuff that again encourages discipleship and builds bonds. And we want to continue again just to be the gospel here in this place. And when people enter in, they enter into a place and feel welcomed and feel warmed. And feel again what God has called us to do. To love others because he first loved us. 
And so again, that's why this list of names is here. That's why Paul gives us all these examples of people who have done these things, is so that we can follow in their example and continue to be the gospel to all that he's introduced us to. So with that, let me pray for us, and we'll continue in worship here this morning. Father, again, we thank you just for letting us come as we are, as we sang earlier and we're about to sing here now. That again, we don't come to you in a way that says, well, I've, I've met the standards. I've met the minimum requirements. We don't come to you and say, well, I can keep working so that I can get better. No, that we come as we are, in our sinful state, as broken people, as people who are yearning for something greater, for people yearning for you. Now we enter into this place, we enter into a relationship with you because you first loved us. That you sacrificed your life on the cross for us. That before we even existed, you knew us and you died for us. And so Father, we pray that you would continue to allow us to share that gospel with those around us. That we continue to take steps out of our comfort zone to build community, to build relationships with those around us because of what this gospel has said. And that we continue, again, just to strive to serve one another, to sacrifice for one another, to work hard for one another, to love one another. And just as Paul has greeted each and every one of these people, again, continue to let us strive for those things. And Father, again, just continue to let your gospel reign throughout our entire lives. That again, that every place that we go to, we continue to, to proclaim the name of Jesus in the way that we act, in the way that we think, in the way that we speak, that people would come to know you through us. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we know that that is possible. And so, Father, we pray and we thank you for all that you've done, and we continue to look forward to the day of your return. And, Father, again, we thank you just for each and every opportunity, for each and every person here that we can build this community with them, that we can love upon them, and they can love upon us. And so, Father, we ask that you be with us here and continue to allow us to strive for deeper relationships and continue just to glorify you in all that we do. So we thank you. We do these. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.